interim co-director of the European Centre for Environment and Human Health um, and senior lecturer at the University of Exeter. Um, but our connection goes back more than a decade since she joined our unit as the first social scientist I managed to recruit in the early years of establishing a research program here. And having done my PhD in a unit headed by a medical sociologist, it was and remains a very sort of exciting aspect of public health research to explore this space between uh, social science and epidemiology. And Connie even came back to Cambridge after spending several years in the Caribbean, which uh, given the difference in the weather, it seems quite remarkable to me that she wanted to come back, but she did. So uh, Connie's career has taken her across various places from Berlin to um, Cambridge and Barbados and now in Cornwall. And uh, Connie, we're very much looking forward to hearing what you have to tell us about the nutrition transition. Thank you, Connie. Thanks very much, David. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so let me move this on. So I am like to make a proposition for this talk. Um, and that is to understand population level patterns of behavior and address contemporary public health challenges. We have to have an appreciation of the complex societal, economic, political changes that have occurred over time and that have shaped these. Uh, and I realize that this isn't a new proposition and has been made by many others. Um, and in fact, um, as David alluded to it, we have been um, flagging this idea for many years and a sort of standard way. Um, we set the scene in our papers at CEDA around commuting and commuting practices and decisions was to explain that the way we live, work uh, or get to work has profoundly changed over time. And this might go a long way explaining changing population level patterns of behavior such as physical activity. Um, so this is societal changes from more manual to desk-based work uh, and commuting on foot, bike or using public transport has given um, way to driving. Uh, and these changes don't stop there as we've experienced during the pandemic um, with home working being um, quite common now. So this is a picture of myself home working. And these um, changes have been happening with or alongside other transitions. So these are sort of transitions um, in mobility or in physical activity. And in my work to understand um, physical, uh, to understand food practices, I can work with the handy concept of the nutrition transition. And I'm sure many people on this call will be very familiar with this concept. And actually, to my knowledge, um, there isn't a similarly widely used concept like the mobility transition. So maybe we should work on that and, and develop an idea around the mobility transition. So the um, nutrition transition um, has been conceptualized by Barry Popkin. Again, many of you will be familiar to this um, uh, to describe global dietary shifts. Uh, and this is um, how we, he would summarize these shifts. So um, away uh, from consumption of fruit and vegetables and legu legumes and high fiber staples and also reduced preparation time towards a global dietary shift um, towards increased consumption of ultra processed foods, snacking and pre-cooked foods or eating out of the home, increased consumption of sugar sweetened beverages, uh, as well as animal source foods and edible oils. And this nutrition transition field um, is um, there's a large body of literature around that um, both sort of describing this um, nutrition transition epidemiologically uh, but I'm particularly interested in um, the research um, that looks at the underlying mechanisms of shifting patterns in nutrition and there's wonderful work by Corinna Hawkes uh, particular linking this uh, to globalization um, I also really like the work of Anne-Marie So and if there are any Cheetah folks um, uh, listening to this talk, um, you might be very, uh, you will be very familiar with Anne Marie's work. And um, uh, more recent work has looked at the environmental impacts and sort of that intersection um, between public health and, and in, uh, environmental change. So today I will give you um, some background on small island developing states, which is one of my main um, research uh, settings where I do my research uh, and uh, the nutritional transition experience in, in these islands. 
And then I will introduce um, two studies of mine. One was a study on historical perspectives on foodscapes in Jamaica. And the second study looked at contemporary perspectives on changing food production and consumption practices in Fiji in the Pacific and St. Vincent and the Grenadine again in the Caribbean. So just a bit of background around SIDS. Um, again, many of you might be very familiar with this, but for those of you who aren't, um, there are 58 of them, 38 um, are official UN members. Uh, there are some outliers, actually they're not all um, islands, um, so places like Belize, Guyana, Suriname are not actually islands. Uh, the other um, perhaps surprising members like Singapore, most countries are in the Caribbean and in the Pacific, and there are two large regional public universities serving these regions, um, the University of the West Indies and the Caribbean and the University of the South Pacific, and they're main partners of mine uh, in this research. So then thinking a bit more about the um, nutrition transition and their number of commonalities and shared challenges um, among these um, SIDS. Um, most are actually middle income. Uh, there are some um, five of um, the poorest countries in the world. One of them is Haiti um, in the Caribbean and we are um, doing some research in Haiti. And they share very high rates of um, overweight weight and obesity and NCDs across these countries, some Pacific and Caribbean islands sort of um, had trends across the world on these. And thinking again more about the nutrition system and linking it to its food systems, um, perhaps another interesting statistic is in terms of um, the high rates of food imports um, in SIDS, in particular the Caribbean and the Pacific. So many islands um, import more than 60% of their food, and actually half of them uh, import over 80% of the food consumed by their populations. And another way to look at commonalities and shared challenges across SIDS um, and thinking about food systems is to think about their vulnerabilities in terms of um, natural disasters and extreme weather events that have been accelerating because of the climate crisis. And that obviously has a strong impact um, as an upstream determinant on food systems um, and then dietary patterns in these islands. Um, and I sort of started with thinking about a temporality in this and across any of these statistics, um, you could look at trends and I'm just giving one example in terms of trends in food input dependency ratios. So the, uh, these are stats from FAO, they're from 2016 and apologies you can't see um, here, but they are tracing um, the change in uh, food imports from 1990 um, on the left to 2010 um, and going up to um, where you can see almost 70% for the Caribbean there and almost 60% for the Pacific on average um, in these FAO stats from 2016. Um, and there's been a really strong policy interest in this, both internationally, so particularly the Food and Agricultural Organization, but also the WHO are doing um, a, a lot of work around this, but also regionally and within countries. And on the right hand side, um, you see um, a picture of the port of Spain, um, heads of government meeting, these are heads of government, there are 20 countries within the Caribbean, uh, that form a economic unit CARICOM. Um, and they um, signed um, uh, 15 mandates, um, which is called the Port of Spain Declaration 2007, to accelerate actions against NCDs. Um, and what's interesting about it is that most of them are really on a sort of structural upstream determinants level. And one example here is one man mandate is um, um, to sort any pursuit for of fair trade policies in all international trade negotiations, thereby promoting greater use of indigenous agricultural products and foods by our populations and reducing the negative effects of globalization on our food supply. So real acknowledgement of this in, uh, in policy. And progress on this policy declaration has been evaluated formally by the University of the West Indies. And this was work led by Nigel Unwin and Alafia Samuels. Um, and I flat, uh, led with a colleague, um, Dr. Maddie Murphy on a qualitative evaluation. Um, uh, of progress in seven Caribbean countries. And we found that most progress was actually made uh, on the more low hanging fruit mandates um, and commitments to more around health education. And least progress has been made on these larger, more ambitious structural policies. Uh, another one would be uh, food labeling, for example. And they experienced much pushback, particularly um, from industry um, making progress on these. 
So thinking back of this concept um, of the um, uh, of local, uh, the kind of challenges local food systems face, a vast majority of SIDS lack food security, and I'm using here the FAO um, um, uh, definition for this, by that we mean access by all people at all times to sufficiently safe and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences in order to lead a healthy and active life. Um, and they lack food serenity. And this term um, uh, means the right to healthy and culturally appropriate food and the right to define their own food and agricultural systems. Uh, and you can imagine things like um, um, trade regulations that hamper local policy uh, decisions um, clearly show that um, this right isn't um, being able to, to be exercised in some of these settings or many of these settings. And kind of summarizing um, what this might mean for a nutrition transition in SIDS. Um, so um, there's an increased availability and consumption of animal protein and foods high in sugar, salt, uh, fat, and low fiber. This is associated with underlying uh, trends in globalization of economies. And a particular symptomatic are food imports. And most food imports are processed foods. Um, some are sort of meats and grains, but um, top of the list is um, ultra processed foods and processed foods. So this leads to an increase in overweight and obesity and related NCDs. Um, and in all states in the Caribbean and the Pacific, um, we see at least a double burden of malnutrition. So uh, um, a burden of adult overweight and obesity, but also anemia in women of reproductive age. But I mentioned there are also low income countries and out of the five poorest sits, um, um, and the five poorest sits um, experience a triple burden of malnutrition, um, including childhood stunting, and childhood stunting is over 10% in these five poorest countries. Okay, so back to my um, proposition. So I have a long standing interest in understanding these changes over time. Um, but I had a chance to explicitly explore this in a series of studies. So, so I am introducing the first now, and I'll rephrase my premise slightly here to highlight the contemporary public health challenges, for example, to influence trade policy, um, but also highlight historical context to shape these. So the MSC and the AHSC offered a partnership a building award. So AHSC is the Arts and Humanities Research Council. So together with the MSC, they offered a partnership building award as part of their GCIF funding, the Global Challenges Research Fund. And I used uh, the opportunity to work with historians and connect them to public health researchers to develop a joint research, around, um, research agenda to work around this area. And we started just focusing in on Jamaica in the first instance. Um, and we tried to explore historical transformations of what we called um, Jamaican foodscapes. And then in a subsequent grant, um, we particularly zeroed in on sugar sweetened beverages. So one of our questions here was, what role does the past and more recent history of the local and global sugar economy play in shaping contemporary Jamaica's consumption of sugar sweetened beverages um, and uh, public health efforts to reduce this crisis? So the methods we used for this, um, we initially did some archival analysis of newspaper articles from 1945 to 2000. So this is a, a common daily newspaper um, read widely in Jamaica. And in our second grant, we added um, quasi -ethnographic, um, a quasi-ethnographic study with this. I'm saying quasi because the pandemic struck um, and we ended up with remote data collection in online and, and phone semi-structured interviews. And also we um, undertook under, uh, online workshops. We did these with 22 stakeholders, including agricultural extension workers and ministries of agriculture, with farmers, restaurateurs, um, people in manufacturing, um, tertiary level students of public health, um, NGO and health sector advisors, and also historians and other academics. And this was undertaken by Jamaican and UK based researchers. Um, so there's actually a large body of literature on um, Caribbean colonial history. Well, I'm, I'm sure everyone will be very aware of this. So we did not try to replicate this um, work, but we used it as an important backdrop for us to understand the context. And if you're interested, I won't share all the um, kind of literature one could dive into, but I really recommend this one book by Malcolm Ferdinand, uh, Decolonial Ecology. He's actually writing about French Caribbean there, but he's using a really interesting political ecology framework um, that maybe health um, geographers um, on the call might find really interesting. And he historicizes issues such as the deforestation and our reforestation and its impact on food systems in Haiti. 
um, and chloricone pesticide contamination in the banana industry in Martinique and Guadeloupe uh, and kind of contamination that, that now prevents a more diversified um, fruit and veg um, production in these islands. So really rich and interesting um, body of literature and quite a lot of it increasingly um, making the connection to the present. So the um, colonial slave plantation economies in Jamaica led to a dominant cash um, crop agriculture, particular focusing on sugarcane production. And this still shapes agricultural systems today and is holding back local food production from diversifying. And here we have an interview excerpt from an agricultural extension work of the ministry. And he says, this is a crop that is 500 years within the Caribbean. And that particular crop has infrastructure throughout Jamaica in every village village in every town in Jamaica is designed around sugarcane. Uh, and it's perhaps also important to note that Jamaica has become a net importer of processed white sh um, sugar. Um, so this is particular because Jamaica is also a place of substantial, um, a substantial manufacturing industry of sugar sweetened beverages, and they actually use imported uh, white refined sugar, not the locally produced um, unrefined sugar. So bringing it a bit um, more into the contemporary and focusing on recent political uh, economic uh, histories, it's interesting to see the shift from production of raw sugar to the manufacturing of sugar sweetened beverages. And this public health um, academic told us in this first quote, we Jamaicans are one of the largest consumers of sweetened beverages in the Caribbean, of many islands in the Caribbean, we're up there. So we are a market that the food industry would want. And if you look at some of the big manufacturers, many of them actually have manufacturing plants here. Um, yet sugar production itself is still protected by the state, but these um, other industry are also taking a, a powerful place in the overall sugar industry in Jamaica. And they hold a really powerful political influence um, and public health advocates feel really strongly about um, that. And here the quote is from one of them to say there's been a lot of pushback by industry here. In fact, they voted against any changes. Here this person talks about front of package labeling, um, but we found the same for the sugar tax in uh, Jamaica. And this was from um, um, interview work, but we also looked at our archival newspaper um, work for this. Um, so as I said, we searched daily newspapers from 1945. And we found a rapid proliferation um, of fast food and related products like sugar sweetened beverages, um, both outlets, so that was identified through newspaper stories about openings of, of um, new companies coming to the island or new branches, and also advertisement of outlets, brands, but also particular products um, like um, Pepsi Cola. And to add more historical context, this coincided with uh, major economic changes in Jamaica, as Jamaica has undergone a, a severe structural adjustment period in the 1980s. Um, I don't know how familiar people are with structural adjustment. Um, so this is um, conditionalities that are programs by the World Bank or IMF that connect um, loans and loan relief to um, severe conditionalities for countries, and that usually means privatization of public services for Jamaica meant um, devaluating uh, their currency and deregulation to open the economy to foreign investment. We also found a sort of multiplicity of uh, messages and that actually included health messaging, uh, but that was clearly dwarfed by more unhealthy advertising. Um, but also um, we found that um, things like grow your own campaigns were very much a reaction to food uh, insecurity uh, in the country. So these are state campaigns, but they have less uh, uh, focus on public health, but more one on relieving poverty. So this was to, um, um, happening during structural adjustment programs, uh, where, for example, um, um, living standards lowered um, sub substantially, and there was a food shortage at that time. So I wanted to end with something more positive um, for this study, and I call it the long arc of history. I'm kind of thinking of the long arc of, I think, just as Martin Luther King calls this, so that there's an arc of the moral universe uh, that bends towards justice. Um, and we found kind of a strong, um, positive um, narrative around the third sector fighting these power dynamics and also working to develop counter narratives in this. Um, so on the left, there's a campaign against the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages that was both um, 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 aimed at the population, but also to um, um, 
to make sure that the population knows what the benefit would be of a sugar tax and supporting um, uh, political decisions around that. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. There probably won't be a sugar tax in um, Jamaica, but they've now shift shifted their um, emphasis on um, front of package labeling. And that is actually one of the mandates of the um, Court of Spain declaration I mentioned before. But again, little progress has been made so far. But there's a real third sector push to um, develop these counter narratives. So just a few um, sort of interim conclusions for this study. Um, so complex historical factors included the changing nature of the sugar industry over time, increasing affordability, availability and marketing of sugar sweetened beverages and poor regulation of the industry and um, a real a strong power in the industry to shape um, local decision making and politics. And these perspectives on historical complexities can make a contribution to the field of commercial determinants of health. Um, so we kind of tried to embed our analysis very much within this field of commercial determinants of health. Um, and we feel that this is really important in all kinds of settings, not just in what might be obvious settings like the Caribbean to think about colonial histories. So we're um, talking about global food systems, transnational corporations. So it's really important to understand these dynamics uh, also in the UK, for example. And the making of new histories uh, is quite important. So this important role of public health stakeholders in public action, for example, against advertising or for taxation or labeling or other regulation, um, disputes with industries they have and shaping counter narratives around health and cultural meanings um, of drinks in our study. The other conclusion I wanted to make is sort of more methodologically. Um, so we felt that new research questions require new inter-transdisciplinary partnerships and ways of working. And although as social scientists, I think we are increasing, um, we are quite um, used to working within public health and with um, epidemiologists, it's kind of a whole different ball game to invite um, historians in these conversations. And we also felt we really have to develop methods to connect this historical accounts to contemporary experiences. And we're still sort of in, in the middle of um, trying to develop these methods. Okay, so the second study I'd like to introduce is looking more at the nutrition transition that people experience in their own lifetime. So I did a slight rephrasing here. So to understand the population level patterns of behavior and address contemporary public health challenges, we have to have an appreciation of the complex social changes that shape these over people's life course. And these on the right here are schoolboys in Fiji um, getting some um, fast food. Okay, so in um, this study, this was another GCF grant, and this was led by Nigel Unwin, and it was a large study aiming to develop methods and a conceptual framework to evaluate community-based food production initiatives and interventions. So programs that help to strengthen local food systems and, and develop a sort of balance against um, the um, food imports and these communities experience. So I led a qualitative study that aimed to understand what influences food practices, cultures and choices, and what part locally produced food sources play in this. Um, so the settings were Fiji in the Pacific and St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the Caribbean. <clears throat> and um, for the previous study, the, the pandemic was in the way. So we the paper is almost published, but I can't um, publicize that yet. But for this one, um, I'm just flagging one paper here and there are a few papers coming out of this. Um, uh, overall project if you're interested. So our methods of this were um, mainly focus groups. So we undertook 28 focus groups uh, in eight communities in St. Vincent and in Fiji. We're interested in communities in urban and rural settings and in um, with different socioeconomic contexts and particularly in Fiji land, different land owning contexts. And we were also interested um, to do some focus groups with adolescents. So we um, chose adult, young adults aged 18 to 20 and separate um, focus groups. Um, data collection, transcription and translation Fiji and the thematic analysis was very much driven by the local, local research teams with access to local communities and understanding of local context. So that was teams at the University of the West Indies and at the University of the South Pacific. 
so we found that growing and fishing were still very common practices um, in all included communities in both settings and homegrown or fished or reared or foraged staple food still persisted. Um, but it was clear that there was a general uh, a generational change um, reported by our communities um, in terms of foods, but also food sources, food, um, bread, rice, tin fish and meats, fast foods, um, pizza and noodles, so largely processed foods. And here is a um, quote from a um, one of our um, teenager focus group in rural Fiji. Um, where the um, boy says, we are all farmers and most of the food we eat is from the garden. And the facilitator asks, anything else apart from the food from your surroundings? A pizza, what pizza if we can afford it? And another quote um, here by an, an older adult, my family, not all the food satisfies the family. I went fishing last week at the creek. Uh, I caught a lot of tilapia, but my eldest son doesn't eat tilapia. He went and bought tin tuna for himself. And actually, I mentioned it was a larger project. So our quantitative dietary survey um, similarly found that 68% in Fiji and 45% in St. Vincent regularly consumed their own produce, but purchasing uh, was the most common source of food um, for all of them. Now, I want to add another word to this, and I want to add complex to this. Um, so these general, generational ch changes were complex. So back to this quote from earlier, the tilapia freshly caught but rejected by a younger generation in this household for tin tuna. Now, analyzing this in our local teams, um, they explained to us that um, tilapia, in fact, is not a native species um, to the Pacific, has a lot of negative perceptions and status associated. Um, it's a ground feeding freshwater fish as increasingly commercially farmed sort of part of aquaculture programs. So we make this um, suggestion in our paper to say that tilapia is eclipsed twice here by the tuna. So it's this high status native ocean fish. It's tin for convenience and labeled with a recognizable brand name. And I actually have another story around this. So um, in our adolescent focus groups, people talked a lot about a, a brand name for chicken. When they talked about chicken, they used the brand name um, as a really desirable product that they like buying. <clears throat> But actually they justified their loyalty to their brand partly because they actually reared and sold chicken to this company. So in other words, it wasn't really just a story of changing taste to sort of the allure of this branded product, but it turns to, um, points towards changing opportunities for livelihoods for these young people as part of a local food production. And also that young people are still involved in local food production and in that local food system. <clears throat> so another aspect to this complex generational cha um, change was that we had many childhood memories about a sort of lived experience or all history of gardening and foraging. But what we found interesting was that we found it also in our adolescence. So here are two, two quotes here um, by a teenage girl. I used to go to the bush with my granddaddy in St. Vincent and then uh, uh, in Fiji an adolescent telling us previously we used to get food from the garden however now we seem to be buying a lot and so there's a felt loss of these practices even for young people and in a way this is indicating that there's a quite a difficult timeline to draw of this um, possible nutrition transition <clears throat> And finally, people also talked about consequences of these changes in really complex ways, and that included um, ecological impacts, impacts on livelihoods. I'm just focusing here on health impacts. So there was a really good understanding of, um, of the link to obesity and overweight and NCDs. And as I think this quote here shows nicely, there's clearly an effort uh, in generally in these islands. Um, to make this link and do this um, uh, health education across the population. So here this um, person, Fiji says, the health department emphasizes we should eat foods from our plantation to protect ourselves from these diseases like NCDs. That is the reason we consume our own farm food. It's really interesting that there seems to be a strong policy message around growing your own. Um, but this might be partly because fresh produce is otherwise really expensive uh, in these settings if shop bought. And it also suggests that there isn't really a straightforward um, story here. Um, and to the right is um, a quote um, 
a kind of discussion around processed foods um, and that some of these might very well come actually from local food systems and local production. So this is an, an urban and formal means a land owning um, male focus group. So tinned meat, tin fish, the ones made in Fiji, sunbell, things like that. Noodles are made in Fiji. All those things are Fiji processed products. And the facilitator asks, so does it matter if they're local from abroad? Any difference? And someone in the focus group says, well, I don't believe so. Maybe even unhealthier. Fiji products have a lot of oil content. Sunbell, tin fish has lots of oil. Overseas product is dry instead. So there is a real um, interesting understanding of um, that um, healthiness of products it might be complex. Um, and actually, um, for example, regulation under countries where some of the imported food is produced might be stronger and therefore these might be healthier products. And there was a sort of a similar discussion around um, fruit and vegetable production um, that um, some, especially in the Caribbean, felt that local produce might be unhealthy because it might be more contaminated with um, pesticides because this is less regulated in these settings. And that maybe some of the imported shop-bought fresh produce might be healthier um, because it, it was produced under um, strong, stricter regulations. So again, some conclusions just for this project. Um, so these lived experiences or oral histories from nutrition transition, transition might help us to explore these particular complexities. And including that um, dietary shifts are experienced by all, but in quite different ways, in non-linear non ways. And I'm particularly interested in kind of realizing how difficult it is to actually write a timeline in terms of how people um, experience these change, um, changes and when they happened. We did see there was an increasing preference for processed foods, despite a, also appreciating that own produce, um, um, that there was a pride in own produce um, and that own produce might be um, sort of the healthy or the, um, the sort of smart um, or cheap way um, to consume, uh, to have a healthy diet. But that suggests that there's a larger, uh, that there are larger cultural transformations of food preferences and practices happening and that they might intersect these structural drivers. So as an anthropologist, I'm really interested in disentangling this more. And then to kind of sum up um, in general, um, I just want to come back to my um, proposition here. So to understand population level patterns of behavior and to address contemporary public health challenges, we have to have an appreciation of the complex changes that have occurred over time through history or over people's life courses or more recent decades. Um, so I'm afraid I will end with saying that more research is needed, <laughs> and I mean it particularly for myself that I feel I've only just started exploring explicitly these, um, these issues, developing methods, developing partnerships, um, uh, and really understanding the different fields that might be relevant for this. So fields in political economy, political ecology, commercial determinants of health, decolonizing global health, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so there are all these fields, I'm not sure they're really linking up that well yet, um, and when they do, um, they're really um, exciting insights, I think, um, that come from this. So I personally would like to do more research to historicize and understand power dynamics I mentioned, how these are established, reinforced, challenged, and changing over time and shaping structural drivers, and, um, and use this to understand political or um, policy barriers, for example, to introducing a sugar tax in Jamaica. In particular, I feel we need to historicize commercial determinants of health in all settings. And again, I just want to stress in all settings, I, I feel this is just as important to understand um, uh, commercial determinants of health work uh, in the UK um, or elsewhere. I also like to historicize more and understand um, practices. I'm very interested in behavior, social practices. And in this example, I'm thinking about food production um, practices, trade acquisition, um, food consumption practices, and all the social meaning and status that comes with them. And it seems really important to learn about this, to develop counter narratives. And I think NGOs are very good at this. And I think in this country in particular, people talk about that we need to develop counter narratives in terms of the climate crisis and, for example, changing um, our dietary patterns towards less meat consumption. 
and we need to push back on narratives that think meat consumption might be something that's that's culturally embedded um, in our societies. And I kind of I feel that we should really work um, more on integrating a temporal perspective in whatever way in our conceptual framework. Um, so, for example, for me as social scientist and public health, I would like to add a historical context, a social change dimension to behavioral or sociological theories to understand conditions for change going forward. As I said, I particularly work on social practice theory, and there's actually some exciting work that, that adds a temporal side to it, um, but I think we can work harder um, to do this. And I think I leave it at that because I'm quite interested to hear what you're thinking about um, this and um, what discussion we could have. I'll just end with some things. Um, it was really hard to think of everyone included in all these different studies. I think it's important to say that there are lots of collaborators and partners on this um, and co-authors. Um, so I can't mention everyone, but I just want to point out a big thanks to Olivia Barnett, Nagjune and Shere. Warmington, Warmington, as well as Mia Morris, who led on the work in Jamaica um, on their qualitative work and archival work. And then my thanks to William Oyezi, who led on the qualitative work uh, in Fiji, and Catherine Brown, who led on the qualitative work in the Caribbean. And obviously, thanks to the funder as well. I, I have to say, we can talk about Tricia F as well, but it was a really good funding stream for really interdisciplinary work. And, and I also have to thank the MRC and the AHSC to be incredibly open for the kind of research we were proposing, which wasn't perhaps um, necessarily something they had in mind when they initially came up with calls like this. Um, and I, I add University of Cambridge, a lot of this research was co-led with colleagues here at the unit. Thanks very much. And I might just stop sharing. very much Connie and uh, well we used to think that finding a way of working between biomedical and social sciences was challenging now we need to embrace history as well so that is definitely both exciting and complex as a proposition I think. Um, so uh, the floor is open for people to pose questions uh, in the chat box or if you since there currently aren't any written questions. If you wish to make an oral question, you could raise a hand signal in Zoom. Um, but you're welcome to type a question, which I will mediate. Um, and we already have one. Uh, on you go, Hannah. Yeah, I don't mind starting because I have lots of questions to ask. Um, I <clears throat> thank you for such a great presentation. Um, and I, th I think I was particularly struck by a point you made uh, in the first study you presented about how essentially the sugar industry has always always had quite a hold um, on the Caribbean in various ways. And I find it somewhat disheartening to see that it seems like that hold hasn't necessarily changed. It's just taken a different form, maybe um, in the form of ultra processed food companies. And I, I wondered, how do we not get disheartened that <laughs> this might not just continue again in another form and, and what kind of things are needed to really break that cycle? Yeah, good question. I mean, I think it is um, interesting, really fascinating to see, especially when I moved to the Caribbean, that there is such a strong um, political will and policy acknowledgement that this is how this should be tackled. I think that the Sort of disheartening bit of it is that everyone knows this is incredibly hard and um you know ambitions that were made in 2007 um it seems disappointing that some of them you know we are now in 2002 and they haven't made that many headways around it um but i think that's great and um what's really interesting is they really try to harness um sort of regionally across the caribbean and the pacific um as their political strength for example in trade negotiations and that even I think um, sort of the whole SIDS idea that small island developing states develop a joint political voice, um, obviously very strong in doing it for climate action. And I think they're increasingly strong in doing it for public health and actually making these connections and see how strongly they're interlinked. Um, I think that is something positive in it, um, maybe more in terms of an international community and maybe that comes more against the climate action is that there is more of an understanding that there is an um, 
um, responsibility within the international community to help countries with this um, and that maybe um, the way we used to do things aren't the right way way and we should think better in terms of um, you know social justice when we think about free trade agreements and things like that and I think that is possibly pushed more through um, through climate action but there are clearly strong especially in the Caribbean strong um, um, a strong push towards um, reparations or an idea that an international community needs to help these systems um, to become um, a stronger voices um, against, say, transnational companies. So it's sort of a slow arc of history. I still believe in this arc of history or justice and that it might bend the right way. Um, and then there is a lot of this ground root um, um, you know, bottom up third sector kind of um, activities going on. Um, and they can be quite powerful. Um, I think some real headways have been made. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> no, I I, I'm going to try. One. Yeah. yeah, I'll try and believe in your long arc of history as well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know now. Sorry, I can't hear you yet. Oh, I thought I had it muted. Yeah, oh, oh, can't just just thank you. I I find your research extremely interesting, and having attempted to do some kind of framework around the commercial determinants of diet, I definitely think uh, when I was doing it, I was like, this this definitely needs a temporal factor into it, how things have changed, and I wonder. When you did this, uh, the focus groups with youth, did you investigate or did you ask them their thoughts about um, how to tackle commercial determinants or in their view, uh, what was their interest into, did they think about health or more like climate change as you were saying now? What, what's kind of their driver to say, we need to change something and the narrative that will appeal to them yeah, good question. To be honest, we didn't ask this, but it's sort of big on my agenda to to ask more about it and ask about the action people would like to see. Um, we kind of had um, follow up projects that were more thinking about sort of co production of interventions um, and sort of co production of solutions to strengthen local food systems, um, and they are. Um, yeah, what's interesting is they go in complex ways. So some of it is definitely a, a strong um, appreciation and sort of um, placing stronger emphasis of what might be termed sort of indigenous practices or indigenous produce. And there are lots of, I think, across the world, great organizations and very grassroots organizations who develop a really strong voice around that. And that is very much kind of connected to commercial determinants of health because it includes, and I think it's the three biggest um, um, pesticide companies who also hold most seeds in the world. And I think most um, smallhold farmers spend most of their um, financial input on the seeds that are commercially farmed. So these kind of grassroots organizations that really try to um, um, democratize um, seeds for example in the seed market um, so there's a lot like that happening so we didn't see that in our focus groups other than that for start they didn't no one spoke about health without making a link to um, the environment environmental exactly. change which is really interesting they mm. didn't talk about health without talking about soil or even talking about it was really complicated the way they on the one hand thought about own projects that can be very positive and is under their control towards saying, you know, the soil we have to deal with doesn't produce the kind of food anymore that would actually be that nutritious as it used to be, or as, you know, contamination our soil um, or our, you know, country has been affected by um, the climate crisis in a way that makes all this really difficult. So in Fiji salination, for example. Um, so that's really interesting. So people think in really complex ways about it. And sort of one of my ideas for the next study is to really invite this joint thinking and learning much more. We, we're particularly working with two NGOs in 
uh, St. Vincent and in Fiji who do um, amazing work around um, kind of more organic um, um, food growing and sort of social justice approaches to this. Um, but there must be loads of these around and I think it would be really nice um, to kind of connect them, It'd be really nice actually to connect them. There's a completely similar discussion down here in Cornwall where I am and, you know, strengthening local food systems. I think it would be really exciting to, to connect these initiatives and actually that is happening. I just feel I'm not that well linked into it yet, but I think there is a kind of whole world out there where a lot of this action is happening. Maybe that adds to the arc of justice <laughs> that a lot is happening. But yeah, I think I, I agree. I kind of just started um, thinking about that in terms of commercial determinants of health framework and how to do it. And I kind of feel probably somewhere out there who does this really well and I haven't come across them yet. So <laughs> thank you. have another question or comment. <clears throat> okay, well, I might take the opportunity to ask one then. So Connie, obviously many people's research has been disrupted by COVID in various ways. And you referred to, I think the term you used was remote quasi ethnography. Um, and I mean, in the past, we've done some work together, which involved a kind of partial step away from fully in situ participant observation using methods like photo voice. But obviously, under these conditions, it's even more removed from the, the scene. What are your reflections on what's been learned from that and the implications for research going forward? Is it is it has it been all just a hassle and an inconvenience or has there any been any sort of upside or learning from having to do things differently? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think um, sort of a bit of both, I guess. I think that there are two things that I often think about doing this kind of work. The first thing is sort of my own positionality in this. I'm, you know, this wide European doing this work and who I am to do any of this work. And I kind of hope I sort of answer it by working with kind of nurtured partnerships I have with great colleagues and um, in many ways they lead the research agenda. I'm really happy um, to be part of it and contribute to it and that we all feel this has to be an international sort of effort of thinking through this and, and doing research on that and highlighting research. And of course the other one is that any of this kind of work, it's very hard to think of a good way to do net zero type global health. Um, but I think definitely we've gone a bit crazy on flying for one meeting somewhere or, um, um, you know, sort of things we used to do without thinking too much about it. And I think the pandemic kind of made us think a bit more about um, what could be done in sort of more efficient ways and not to jump on a plane for this. Um, and a lot of the research we've done, um, to be honest, particular working with stakeholders who are very busy people um, to do kind of workshops, seminars um, and interviews through Zoom or Teams um, is a really good way of doing it. I think we used to do either in-person interviews or we did phone interviews and to have the chance using a medium we are so familiar now and you can see the other person often you do see sort of the background and you can have these other chats we like to have around interviews. I think all this can work really well. Um, some of it worked well also working more with community members and we did sort of interviews over WhatsApp, um, which actually worked better than trying to do a sort of old style photo um, uh, phone interview. But in many ways we did struggle with, um, I think even for photo voice, you have to have seen communities, you have to, develop a way of working together, how they want to use it. I mean, the whole idea of sort of more system science methods in a qualitative way is that they, um, they shape the methods in a way that's meaningful to them. And to try to do that in a sort of participant information sheet or in sort of written instructions um, is really hard. And I think to develop um, this kind of these ways of working together, it's still better to be there in person. So we tried a sort of photo voice element that we largely ditched, except for people who kind of sort of naturally said this would be a nice way for them to communicate with us. Um, 
So I think some of these things, um, there's some good things I think we want to keep. And then there are other things where I think we really learned how sometimes it is important to, to be there and have dialogue together and to learn um, what different people want to get out of a certain process like a research project. Um, and yeah, I think that made it difficult. And there are some things you can't do, I think, too. So my um, ethnography, ethnographer doing this work, she's never been to Jamaica. She worked really closely with a Jamaican researcher. She's really interested in food ethnographies and she would eat herself through a food ethnography in that kind of new place. And I think she feels she really lost out on having had that experience. And I think she really enjoyed working with local researchers and trying to develop an, a kind of own story around the research. But I think she also feels like she can't tell the kind of story she would have liked to tell if she had been able to do it. Um, so yeah, a bit of both. <laughs> as I suspected. Yeah, thank you. That's a very interesting answer. Okay, we've time for another topic if anyone has one. Okay, Preeti has a question about the participation of women in the workforce. Um, do you want to pick that one up, Connie? Yeah, thank you. Um... It, I, I don't know about this, but uh, there's some great sort of feminist literature um, developed in Jamaica, sociological um, literature um, that probably would be really useful to see, um, to understand that. Um, so yeah, I don't know how that has changed. I think we saw changes that um, definitely move people more out of the house and more kind of um, into consuming food on the go or as they're working outside of their households. And so a typical example is the Jamaican patty. Um, the historian Professor Matt Smith, Smith we work with, um, with give this as an example that Jamaican patty isn't something that has been for ages uh, a typical food. It really came in the 1970s with um, uh, commercial ovens that the patty became this kind of product people could, could eat on the go. And that I think is very much connected to also um, livelihoods changing and, and ways of working changing and people going more into offices or or, or doing other types of work. Um, but it's a great question and I don't have a proper answer for this. Okay, thank you. Jody, you had a question? <clears throat> yes, thank you very much for your interesting presentation, Connie. Um, as someone who grew up in Aruba, um, studied there, et cetera, et cetera, I am very well aware of the local context there. And I think I can generalize that a bit to the other countries that you spoke about today, islands, I guess I could say. And I know that we have a Dutch word for it, Vrintjes politiek, which I guess translates to nepotism. I know that's a really big thing there. If you're a friend of a friend or a cousin or blah, 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 you can really get your way on the islands and that can work in your favor or that can kind of work against you. So my question is, have you noticed that maybe making policy changes could perhaps be kind of easier or have you noticed big differences between how it maybe would normally go here in the UK versus on the islands? Um, yeah, thank you. I mean. In such stark terms, we haven't seen that. I mean, the one thing I can say, particularly doing policy analysis work um, in these settings and trying to do um, stakeholder mapping, stakeholder interviews um, set across different sectors, uh, representing different roles and different islands, you very quickly realize that people move around. It's a region people might have studied together, people might have worked in the Ministry of Health uh, for a while. Now they're working at uh, the Pan American Health Organizations and they're just taking up an academic role somewhere. So they wear many hats. Um, or you might have someone who um, is kind of um, leading a health NGO, but they're actually also um, running a, a, a business. Um, so in a way, they're also representing private sector or a private sector association. 
Um, so you would do interviews with people and you ask them a question about, say, um, policy, third sector and academia or so. And they say, well, with which hat should I answer this question? I could actually cover at least two or three of these angles. Um, which is kind of a bit mind boggling, just trying to do the research and trying to do this kind of stakeholder mapping. But obviously what they're talking about and what is interesting is that that can be a positive thing and you can have, um, say, a so one thing that came out of this Port of Spain declaration were these NCD commissions and you can have people on there who are quite powerful voices and they are because they're the main cardiologists, but they're also um, have a real good connections to certain ministries because they might have used to work there and they're kind of a well-known prof at the university and and all this so there some things can happen because of that um, but on the other hand say in our um, several country policy evaluation there are small countries where one person has so many hats on and has to look after so many say resorts in the ministry that they they just find find it hard to make any progress in one particular area if there's so many um, challenges that need to be a, uh, addressed. So yeah, that's, I mean, that's not quite an answer to your question, but that's definitely something we experience in these settings, which can make it really interesting, um, but really difficult as well. Great, thank you. Well, we are out of time. Um... Connie, thank you very much for your very interesting talk and to those of you who have chipped in uh, stimulating questions. Um, I'll just pass finally over to Hannah if there's any other bits and pieces to wrap up before we close the session. Thank you. Yeah, all. thanks. My pleasure. <laughs> yeah, thank you again, Connie. And thank you, David. Um, it's been a really great morning. And I just want to remind everyone that we will be posting the recording online and you can see other past events that we other seminars that we posted at the MRC on the link that I posted in the chat. But thanks again for joining and uh, hopefully we'll see you again in autumn.